over the weekend of the 31st of January and the 1st of February, a team of Miggle developers got together to have an in-depth look at Drupal 8, which is currently at beta. They wanted to establish to what extent Drupal 8 was usable as a content management system to build production sites right now. They also wanted to get an idea of when Drupal 8 launches, what changes it would mean to our established processes and procedures for developing sites in Drupal 7. We're going to take a look at a video now that shows you how they got on. I'm going to build out a blog using Drupal 8 configuration management into a an ad version. Perfect. Um, I'm going to be migrating a Drupal 7 site to Drupal 8 and be focusing on the theme inside of it. I am uh, migrating an existing client website to Drupal 8 to see how it improves the user experience. I'm going to build out a search interface using the search API and hopefully connect to external um, services such as Apache Server. Yeah, so my plan is to basically look at um, our deployment and see how deploying Drupal 8 sites will be different from deploying Drupal 7 sites. Uh, also looking at the infrastructure, uh, things like Drush 7, Composer, and everything that kind of surrounds the, kind of the operations side of Drupal 8. I'm going to look at Drupal 8 from the point of view of a uh, dumb site builder, um, <laughs> as in uh, installing it on Acquia Dev Desktop and just seeing what obvious hitches, changes, differences uh, sort of make themselves known. <laughs> so, um, yeah, what are you going to be focusing on this weekend? Today I'm going to be building a module that uses a Chuck Norris Quotes API to create a blog that you can place anywhere when you're on Drupal 8 side and probably add a token as well so you can uh, put a little token of a Chuck Norris quote into any emails that the site sends or something along those lines. Great. Um, so I've been looking into migration and realised that there's not a lot at all for migration from 7 to 8. Uh, there's been a lot of focus from 6 to 8, but um, yeah, 7 to 8 there's no in here really, basically. And uh, the UI is not complete, everything has to be done on the command line. Uh, there's patches that need to be done for like, exporting databases. Um, yeah, it's not ready. So. Xavier, what have you what have you found? Um, I found that Drupal 8 has got a lot of room for improvement. Lots of things that you kind of take for granted Drupal 7 aren't ready yet on Drupal 8. Uh, for example, the kind of main basin that I've been using recently, which is Bootstrap, is um, the latest version isn't actually um, tagged yet, so you have to pull it. Using Git. Well, I have 
created a custom block through code, which was quite a pleasant experience. So yeah, using the plugins instead of any hook inflows was quite nice. Just yeah, create an object, stick it in the right place, and I now have a lovely block support in my uh, block administration interface. Oh, amazing. Well, Mr. Louis. Um, I've been looking at the search API module and basically looking at how I can use the database backend module that's bundled with the search API to extend that to index search results on the server. Excellent. Ian? So far I've been building out the Drupal 8 website and found that the UI is very similar to Drupal 7 which is good from uh, an editor's point of view. For some of the fields that we use, like inline entity forms, doesn't exist for Drupal 8, so I think there's going to be a bit of limitation for us to actually migrate over to Drupal 8 uh, for production sites. And I'm now going to start looking at theming. Excellent. Adam? Um, I spent a while going through Acquia Dev Desktop, which needs to be a new version for Drupal 8 eventually got that sorted out and then did a quick run through and found yeah it's fairly similar to Drupal 7 there are certainly some things that from a site builder point of view are great like not having to install visible things from scratch and so on. I then had a quick run using the migrate update module on a simple Drupal 6 site that I had which had some success. Um, imported users, roles, and files successfully, didn't import taxonomies or nodes, and I've no idea why at this point. Uh, so maybe just it was a weird setup in the first place. Maybe it just needs to be cool. um, So I've looked a little bit into uh, the different testing methods that we use in, uh, in, in Drupal 8, so it seems it is much more uh, unit testing opposed to the way that a uh, simple test in Drupal 7 worked. Um, also looked into kind of how we'll be using Composer potentially to manage dependencies. Uh, it seems like actually using something like Composer Manager would be a more a Drupal specific way to do that. Um, so yeah, plenty more to look at around that I think. So Adam, what have you found today? Well, Drupal 8 isn't ready from prime time. <laughs> Uh, a lot of it is there. They're just oddities that break, but there doesn't seem to be anything that handles media properly yet. From a quick look around, I couldn't see anything that's actually working yet. The profile, that, that's going to make that build a single block. During and otherwise, the site is still a bit from the UID. The, the, the idea being that we want every version of the site generated by that code is the same. But you could just have something that says that's code code. Code. Have a module or something. So, yeah, it's got to do it at an early enough stage. Just before you try to start any other Yeah. How has your day gone in? Yeah, it's gone well. Uh, I think it's your mates ready for kind of client sites, but for us, it's a bit of how it works. So, what's not ready from a client perspective at the moment? Um, a lot of modules and the way we produce stuff in the, in the back end. We uh, use ECK and entity reference with inline entity forms. None of that's going to be ready. So, for separate entities, it goes to my mind. So, when you say not ready, does that mean that there are uh, bugs that are stopping that from being ready? Like, are there bugs in like kind of issues, queues that you could fix to get that ready? Uh, there's currently no plans of actually building Drupal 8 versions, so maintainers are looking at just Drupal 7 versions. So uh, the whole module needs to be built on the top. Okay. So has anyone found any actual bugs with D8 today? I've not found anything really specifically, just kind of the modules that have been trying to add on and use. We identified some modules which I think we would need to be stable. Be usable for it's something that we could use in place of Drupal 7. Uh, certainly, there's, there's some things that we've become really used to using in Drupal 7, which, um, yeah, 
there's nothing to do quite yet, so we just keep kind of move forward with that. So there's not even like something in Drupal 8 that we could backport into 7 and use if we were doing things in a different way, or is it just... Yeah, there's things we, that, that we could use and do it in a different way. Um, I think... Uh, and there's, there's some, some workarounds that we could use for it. So, so, so stuff like uh, um, not using content types for, for like certain entities, so we become used to kind of separating out some functionality into uh, ECK like specific entities. Uh, and there's, there's ways of doing that in code still, so there are workarounds. I mean. But um, for me, the biggest challenge I think is around kind of working with code and moving things around. Uh, there's some kind of challenges around that, I think. But I think we've got to the bottom of it and found some other people talking the same, same language about kind of continuous integration with Drupal 8, moving things uh, through code and using testing and stuff. So. It's going to be a challenge, at least at first, but there's some stuff in So what are the missing modules then that we would, the modules that we depend on that aren't? It's more from, from a client perspective, I think. We've, we've started to clean up content types and the administration stuff for, for clients using things like field collection, uh, where we can group certain fields, uh, not field collection, field group, we can group certain fields into certain areas so that our clients only see the bits that they really need to edit. Um, and there's, there's some other things, um, so what was it, in, inline entity forms, so generally we like to kind of make it so that clients only need to edit the content in one place so they don't have to go to multiple places to edit things, so uh, inline entity form stuff is quite a kind of a uh, big thing for us and not, not having that I think is a, is, is a bit of a challenge at the moment. Um, but I think there's ways ways of getting around that but it just means that the, the layout isn't quite as nice as we'd like at the moment. There's so, also some other modules that we use that maybe are not part of the standard um, kind of install when we start from scratch but are still quite useful. Um, just for little bits of functionality here and there, uh, which are not up to the AAA. So, lots more just to kind of, from a contrib standpoint, to be improved. On. So, where those modules aren't ready, is that because module maintainers aren't actually focusing on 8 yet and they're still focused on 7? I think so, yeah. And I think a lot of it is down to the fact that there's not really enough stability within Drupal 8 for them to dedicate the time because um, people are still working on lots of core functionality so it's not really worth their time to be working on a module and find down the road that the API is completely changed and they're using. Search API for Drupal 8 and potentially how I could start to kind of progress on, on other modules that plug into Search APIs, such as uh, the Search API Solar module. Um, I quickly found that actually it wasn't, I couldn't kind of take what was in Drupal 7 and, and sort of use examples from the Drupal 8 Search API module and kind of make, make that upgrade. I needed to look into the Drupal API a lot more and sort of plugins and how services work. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't progress very far with that without kind of spending a lot more time looking at the, the docs for Drupal 8. Um, and then today I picked up from where Stuart left off yesterday, working on the Chuck Norris block, um, which essentially integrates with uh, an API a web service and pulls in jokes from the Chuck Norris database. So essentially, I've built 
and a clock that, that ref when you refresh the page, gets a new joke each time. And um, I looked at trying to use Composer to install the, the client package for that. Um, but again, I need to, to look into how services work to be able to do that in, in a better way. Rather than bundling the package with the module to have it as a, a dependency that gets installed with Composer. Excellent. Uh, and how was the uh, module that generates the block together? Um, so, there's, I, I used, it's, it's not a module, it's not a uh, set of command line tools called Console, Drupal Console, which helps to just um, generate a, a sort of skeleton module, as it were. Um, so that creates the sort of directory structure required for a duplicate module, um, and then I just had to define a service using the services.yaml file, and also uh, the block was was created by extending the, the block base um, interface. I think. Let me just check. Yeah. So there's there's an abstract class that you can extend to create blocks. It's, it's just using that, um, and that file is located in the, the source plugin block directory. So, can we contribute this back? Is this something that I think structurally? Yeah, I think to be honest, a lot of people are, are waiting for this module before they take any science <laughs> life. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's definitely something we can look at extending, and, and it might just be a useful module for people to have a look at examples. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I was looking into configuration management and essentially how we would do those changes um, through to uh, different environments. Um, one of the biggest blockers that I hit straight away was the fact that every site is given essentially a UUID, and that UUID essentially links that site to its configuration. So one of the things that we have to do to get around that is to essentially uh, make sure that every site uh, has the same UUID. Um, so there's a number of people who are already discussing this and there's some strategies for, for, for handling that. So uh, essentially the starting point I've got is that we have a master dependency module as we have always done before. But this master de uh, de dependency module, um, when you first enable it, sets your site ID to the same as the code base essentially. Uh, which means that then you can import any of the configurations uh, that, that are in the code directly into your site. Um, so it doesn't work in the same way as features, um, so you don't necessarily have individual modules that define the configuration, instead you have one big part of code which defines all of the different uh, configurations in YAML files. Uh, so one of the tutorials I went through uh, defined how you would essentially kind of get around the, the, kind of the default behaviour by setting up uh, essentially your own storage uh, area where you would put the different configuration files. Uh, so in this instance I've set a uh, additional setting in the settings.php file down here uh, which essentially says that all the configuration is going to live at a place called deploy which is living at sites default deploy. Uh, this isn't necessarily the best place to put it. Uh, essentially all of the configuration files essentially uh, store potentially quite sensitive data because it might have your site email address, it might have different passwords for, for, uh, for specific APIs and things like that. So uh, they suggest that you store it outside of the, uh, the web route or in the files directory because the files directory can potentially be protected. Um, so there's a number of challenges there and things that we need to think about further down the road, but for now I'll just put it in the uh, site's default deploy, uh, deploy directory. Uh, and then once the site is configured with that, it means that you can essentially make changes uh, locally on your site, commit those changes into the deploy directory, uh, and then push that 
Um, and so the next step I did was to essentially automate that process uh, using a Jenkins job. Uh, so I've got a Jenkins job here. Uh, and this is essentially based at the moment on our continuous integration process. Uh, it checks out some code whenever someone pushes uh, up to a repo. Um, and then it performs another, a number of automated uh, steps. The first one it does is to pull out any composer packages because it requires Drush 7 as opposed to Drush 6, which normally lives on the server. It, it uh, pulls out Drush locally for itself. Um, I've commented out here, but it essentially the server it can install the site and enable master dependency module, uh, then run updates. And then finally, this is the most important part, uh, it basically runs a command, drush, cim, deploy, to basically uh, import the configuration uh, using drush from deploy directory, which you find in the settings of PHP. Uh, so that essentially means that you can move that configuration directly from your local site. Uh, here's what I did earlier, where essentially this is a default Drupal install with minimal and Baltic theme enabled, uh, and I've essentially just set up a new content type through configuration. Uh, so there's the car content type which I've set up through the configuration management tools. Um, at the moment, it's, it supports anything that's in cores, so you can do taxonomy, you can do fields, content types, uh, and all of that just then lives in the YAML files within that, that site's um, settings uh, config directory. Um, yeah, so the next steps would be to integrate testing into that. Um, there's some other modules as well that emulate some of the stuff that Features does. So um, there's one called Config Packager, which essentially does the same sort of thing as, um, as Features, allowing you to bundle together certain different bits of config. Uh, so potentially further down the road, there'll be ways of kind of doing that in a slightly more kind of a manageable way rather than one big directory full of, uh, full of config files. Okay, so uh, my goal was to look at recreating an existing legal uh, client site, and so I went for one called Bishop's Field Capital. And the reason I started on this one is because it has very uh, limited kind of content types, it's about three altogether. It integrates with views for certain sections. And it also has uh, some theme and elements which are kind of overly complicated. So this is just basically the home page. And to build this, I have two content types. So we've got a basic page and an article. And the basic page and article include kind of three fields. You've just got the standard title, body, and image field. And by doing this, I noticed in Drupal 8, the way that fields are managed is slightly different to Drupal 7. So an example, if you have a Manage Fields tab, and this is where you create your fields. You then have a Manage Form display, which allows you to alter what's actually on the edit screen. Um, an example of this is you can now disable the Promote options, you are able to disable like authored on, uh, whereas in Drupal 7 it is always on the node edit screen. You can't kind of control their layout. And then the next one you have is Manage Display. Manage Display very similar to Drupal 7 in the fact it's the layout of what the end user's going to see. Um, because we use Display Suite quite a lot in Drupal 7, I wanted to see if there was a way of altering display modes. And out of the box, you can actually do that in Drupal 7, uh, in Drupal 8, so. so you have an option for display modes, and you can actually alter the display modes for both the form and the end user, which, which I think is a definitely a benefit. Um, there's, there's some options here that are, are kind of still missing. That, that I like to use, and one of these is field groups. And the reason for field groups is to kind of just group data together, which is easier for, for an editor to look at. Um, once I had the content type set up, 
I then looked at views, and once again, views is now in the core of Drupal 8. Uh, works very similar to Drupal 7, but there are some slight differences. An example of this is in uh, contextual filters. A lot of the times you would usually kind of just add a contextual filter by NID, whereas it's now being renamed and it's actually node then ID. So a few of the wording options have changed. Um, but apart from that, views work very similar to, to Drupal 7. Now, the next part is once I actually set up the content types and set up some dummy data was the actual theming layer and how the theming was done. Because everything is now done in uh, Twig. And for this, I created a few kind of template files. The first is the outer wrapper, so the, the main HTML markup. This has very, very similar things to Drupal 7. You have your kind of page top, page bottom, page uh, label variables. You then have a page.html.twig file. And this is kind of when the differences uh, kind of really kick in. So I found that you no longer have to set classes by doing like a preprocessed node or preprocessed page. You can classes should now kind of be defined inside the template files. Now, if a module has actually created classes. In Twig, you're now actually able to extend that or remove classes or even just show the classes that you wish. So we don't have to rely on a module developer to say, these are the classes, you've got to use all of them. And I was also looking at how the main kind of themes are set up. So a few of the file names have now changed and the way that you actually pull in custom kind of JavaScript or CSS has altered and from this I just thought we'd create a custom maintenance page um, and that allows you to create a custom kind of template file which basically uses the same variables which are inside page.html.twig and so if you're a anonymous user at the moment you just get a basic kind of site under maintenance page. Um, to kind of help me with all this and just to help the rest of the team, myself and Gemma started creating a bit of a wiki. And this wiki kind of goes through just the tasks that we had in mind of how to create the theme. It goes over how to create kind of new view modes and how fields have changed. And then Gemma's also created a few herself. And so. I so once Ian and I realised that a lot of what we're doing is overlapping, I'm going to try and repeat everything Ian's just said. But, um, so yeah, I went, I went through um, the basic um, layout of the theme <clears throat> and started to sort of write down certain things that were different and some cool things. So just um, defining regions is a lot simpler and easier. And you can do things like over, override style sheets remove style sheets and um, do like the quick edit style sheets. Um, also something else that I looked at, which I call the responsive um, images. It, um, it's like a corner of Drew Play. There's a responsive image and breakpoint modules that you need, but you can quite quickly um, uh, enable the modules and then set breakpoints for each of the images, like the large, medium, and small. And you can set your own um, image presets um, in the image styles, like you would in Drupal 7, and then you create the breakpoints that way where you want them to break. Another cool thing about um, the theme side of it, it's um, the Drupal Twig theme debug. Basically, in 
sites that we will um, So in sites default services, uh, if you simply change debug um, from false to true, then you get um, but all the all the template suggestions. And before it was just a bit of a hassle to um, find out what template, where the template's coming from, or what template you should be using. Um, so it's just made it simpler. Before you could do like um, use the devil. The demo module or um, theme book suggestions, but this has just made it really simple just simply by doing a debug tree. Over the course of this weekend, um, I took my personal website uh, and built it using Drupal 8. Um, and part of the goal throughout this weekend was to um, add a blog functionality to it and um, See about uh, version controlling it and the configuration management interface. So, originally I started looking at uh, the CMI for Drupal 8 and found that um, there are quite a lot of complexities that still need to kind of be worked out in order for it to work um, in that production environment. Um, and then Steve kind of carried on with that um, today as well. So I moved on to um, theming and kind of building out my blog. Um, I found that using Twig was actually really easy and simple to do. Um, and with having kind of minimal thoughts, I was able to take an additional template and get what I wanted, where I wanted it, really simply. And out of the box, um, creating the blog was super simple as well because the content type and um, <coughs> views were included with Drupal 8 out of the box, so I didn't really have to do much um, in the way of, kind of creating views and stuff, which is new compared to Drupal 7. So, in here, um, I've got the kind of same pages as I've got on my HTML version of my original site. But now there's a blog tab, which um, I was able to add a test article to, um, and tagging and everything was just included in it out of the box. In addition to that, I noticed that now Drupal 8 comes with um, forms. Um, so it's quite easy to add contact forms to your site. Um, I was able to literally just add a link to a contact form and get all of this um, there uh, on my site. It's really uh, So originally... So Xavier, those forms are like web form or entity form? Um, I, I believe it's built upon entity forms. Another thing I noticed is that there's small differences with um, menus and blocks because uh, menu items and blocks are now entities in Drupal 8. It means that you can include them in multiple places throughout the page. Um, so you can have the same block twice? You can have the same block twice. Mm -hmm. um, and you can have it in different regions, which is a great um, okay, so I was looking at stuff just from the site builder point of view. I used Acquia Dev Desktop, uh, the new version 2, which you need because PHP is a later version. Uh, generally worked pretty well. Settings.php can get confused if you retrace your steps partway through, so I had to sort of uninstall, restart, reinstall, and then it was all okay. Um, file structure overall, I like the core directory, it makes things much clearer. Um, the sites directory, which still has settings and files and so on, I wondered if that still seemed a little bit confusing to me. Mm -hmm. 
but we'll see how that works out. Uh, user interface things, uh, stuff that I liked about it. The module page has search built in, and uninstalling modules also disables them. So you don't have to go to the list to disable it first, then to the uninstall page to actually uninstall it. So the uninstall page does both. The content and people pages use views, or what was the views admin before, which is nice because it's uh, easier and more flexible. Uh, the people page has list permissions roles right at the top, which makes sense. You don't have to go to permissions and then down to roles. Mm -hmm. WYSIWYG editing by default, great. Quick edit, great. If it's working, it was very unreliable for me. Uh, node preview is a real preview, and you get to choose which display mode you're using, which is nice. The blocks page, uh, easier to work with because the unused ones are grouped in the right sidebar, which is nice, and yeah, they're other all entities and have uh, types and are field fieldable and so on, which is great. Um, yeah, content types, as you said, there's now the display form uh, area as well. The admin theme is responsive, which is nice, but as far as I can see, it only seems to be to the phone landscape level. If you do phone portrait, it still has some horizontal scrolling needed, so I'm guessing they just decided there was a minimum practical width that was required for their forms. Um, Stuff I didn't like about the UI, not very much really. The toolbar doesn't have, as it comes out, doesn't have drop downs. I'm sure some of you will be doing an extension for that. The module page, it has a search on it, but it doesn't have the features of the module filter thing. Uh, and the module page, that you have to uncollapse the divs to check if there's a config link, which seems a totally unnecessary extra step for it. What was that? On the module, the extent page uh, for Drupal 8. Um, if you get, if you want to see whether any of those modules actually have a config, you have to click on that oh, yeah, and drop it down at first. So then I looked at migrate and uh, <coughs> migrate update module, which provides a UI for migrate and migrate Drupal. And I tried importing a fairly simple Drupal 6 site. So you start from an existing uh, Drupal 8 site, the form is at slash upgrade, so it's a bit like the slash update uh, thing that you would get elsewhere. And you need the source site URL and database access details. So I had partial success, as I said before, it managed to import the users, the roles, the files, the content types, but not the fields inside the content types. It didn't import uh, the taxonomy, the views, the fields for the content types, or the actual nodes. So I don't know whether this is because of something on in the D6 site that I was working with to start with, or it's just not great. So yeah, it does some bits which might be useful at this point, but not really to be relied on. Uh, some bugs that I found. Uh, in core, quick edit doesn't always appear from the contextual menu at all, and when it does, it doesn't work very consistently. Mm -hmm. uh, previewing a saved article seems to save the changes and drop you right into view for the article rather than actually previewing it, as opposed to previewing a new article, which seemed okay. I also got a server error when I was trying to edit the preview after going to a different mode. So display mode by default, change to teaser mode, preview, then try and edit the content again, and it went too lovely with that. I had problems attaching images to the articles, didn't always work the first time. The install new module function doesn't seem to do anything at the moment. Really? No, you just have to go back and install it manually. Right. Uh, and there's a consistent missing file, uh, CSS file, in Arctic theme, whatever. Uh, contrib stuff, the masquerade module crashes the module list page. I tried out one theme called business, which gave a server error when I made a default, so yes, things for that. And then I went through and looked at overall a bit of sort of which contrib modules did, didn't have current DH releases. The one bit which I 
found, which really seems to be missing at the moment, is media stuff. So you can do the basics of file and image handling. You can attach a file and an image, and that's all in core, which is nice. Um, and I found the default uh, Acquia Dev Desktop 2 installation gives you a 128 meg file upload, which is a lot bigger than you had ever got before, which is good. <clears throat> but if you want media galleries and so on, there's no real solution right now at all for it, it seems. Uh, when we were in Amsterdam, I went to, I suspect some other people did as well, went to a presentation on media in Drupal 8, which was talking about this. So they're proposing something called Media Entity as a general API system for incorporating any types of media or entities within entities. And it looks like Scald and Meteor are probably migrating to this. Uh, but there's nothing really there for it yet that I can see. There is a media entity module. Um, and then there's a whole lot of sub-modules like media entity image, media entity Instagram, which are on GitHub. There's no actual dev releases for them at the moment. There's one called Media Pink Eye, which is supposed to provide a user interface for it, which doesn't really yet. There's also a couple of modules, there's one called Entity Browser and Entity Embed, which were related to this presentation that we saw, and those are supposed to be, again, kind of API modules that developers can use to plug into. So if you want to embed any kind of entity within text, using WYSIWYG, for example, you've got the entity embed thing. If you want to track down what entity it is you want to find, there's the entity browser thing. But I bunged all that in, and none of it seemed to work at all, as far as I could find at the moment. So that, from a building site point of view, seems to be the biggest missing thing at the moment. Most of the others you could kind of work around. Uh, but yeah, this one just ain't there right now. So I've had a quick look into the Drupal, con Drupal console. It's just a command line interface that someone's built using the Symfony um, command line. And it, you can use it to do loads of pretty cool stuff within Drupal 8. So you, if you run, go into your, yeah, there's a list of commands. If you go into your, download it using curl, and it's just one command install. I mean, you can run Drupal, and it will give you a list of all the commands. And then you can do pretty cool stuff like Drupal generate module, and it will. <laughs> it will give you lot of options like module name, and then it will then ask you machine name, but it will kind of default it to your module name. So it's really easy. You can pretty much just write my module, enter, 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 enter. And it will generate a whole module with controllers, the whole layout for you. And it's just all out of the box. It gives you a pretty cool help function as well, all kind of built based on your description. Um, and then kind of building on that, you can do stuff like Drupal generate plugin block and put in your block name and kind of simple stuff like that and it'll generate a basic block for you all in Drupal standards, um, kind of coding standards. And then at that point you just change the text of a block name and you've got a whole module with a block all ready to go from just run a few commands. And there are some other stuff you can do with it but I've not really looked into it. A cool thing is you can run Drush from it so as Steve was saying earlier about the Jenkins build, you're installing Drush into it. If you you could run Drupal Drush and then the Drush command after that. Right. So it's like kind of cutting out a bit of a step there. So what does it act as a, act as a wrapper around Drush itself? Yeah, it's just got, I um, don't know how it works. But yeah, you run Drupal Drush CR and it'll catch rebuild for you. Yeah, but on, if you go to drupalconsole.com, or one word, um, it will give you a whole list of commands and how to install it. Um, so, 
I think one of the key takeaways from from this weekend is the fact that certainly there's a lot more that needs to happen in Drupal 8 to make it production ready. Um, there's certainly a lot of contract modules which are still catching up. Uh, there's certainly lots of things in core which are still got uh, issues with it. Um, and there's not necessarily documentation around all the stuff that is there. So uh, from my perspective, there's some things around configuration management which could do with standardizing and certainly from our workflow, that's something I'd like to standardize as we kind of move forward with, with Drupal 8. Um, there's a number of themes which maybe we could, we could help with porting over to Drupal 8. Um, I think that theming is something which we're quite strong on in-house and something that, that, that we can certainly look at. Um, from a search API perspective, it, it may be a little bit too um, too complex at, the, at this point, but certainly we rely on search API, on, on Apache Solo and search experiences a lot. So it's going to be a while before that's, uh, that's stable and that's something which we should probably look at. Uh, getting involved in if we can. Um, so just using Search API in Drupal 7 would be a good start and so I think on our next projects we'll use Search API for everything that we're doing there. Um, there's a number of modules which still need porting, so I'd have highlighted the media module, uh, that's something that maybe we could look at, um, seeing if there's stuff that we could help with on that. Um, I know Ian's looked at patching uh, the existing media module before and there's some things there which we should not be able to help with. Uh, and certainly from a testing perspective, we should probably log any of the issues that we found today and try and kind of find out the people who are responsible or, 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 or the people who might already know of these issues and see if we can contribute any of our feedback to that. Um, and generally, if there's any way we can fix those bugs. So um, I think over the weekend, we've certainly noticed a number of those things. I mean, I, I, I noticed an issue with the uh, the Vlad uh, Vagrant box that we're using and have contributed that fix back. And so there's probably other areas that we can contribute back as well. So um, I think it's all about just trying to seek out the people who are responsible at the moment for, for, for those areas of Drupal, which um, are going to be essential for us going forward. And if there isn't people already spearheading those areas of Drupal, we should look to get involved in that as much as possible, I think. Um, but I'm certainly open to, um, to, to, to everyone else kind of pitching in and seeing if there's specific areas that they want to focus on. I think. I think another big thing that we need to do to contribute back to the community is start writing documentation that we submit to Drupal.org because I noticed in my development over the weekend that many bits of functionality just don't have much, if any, documentation at all. Um, and it made it quite difficult for me to try and figure out how to um, get from point A to point B. In a lot of well, I think one of the challenging things as well is the fact that uh, it's not got a stable release yet. There's still issues. And so I think everyone is holding back from kind of committing to anything, getting like modules ported or writing documentation stuff because it's still in flux. Certainly, the configuration stuff I looked at, uh, there was comments on a, on a blog article which was written five months ago, and all the comments said, Oh, this has changed now. You need to adjust your entire blog article to basically say this. Uh, and then, actually, what I was doing was testing it against the, the latest development version, which didn't work. So, you know, there's generally everything in flux at the moment. So, I think it's just see what happens once it becomes stable, I guess. If there was no Drupal 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and Drupal 8 were your only option for building a website in, um, what kind of website could you build in it and push to production now? You could build bishops. Right. You couldn't build... So basically fairly simple brochureware websites where you're not looking at doing too much in terms of stuff with images, relying on too many derivatives being created for images because of the stuff that you're missing in media model module yeah. that you could do. But you've still got the things like uh, all the image styles and so on and so forth. Okay. That's all still there. Oh, right. From the media module's point of view, it's the, all the reusing media items, which you need 
that doesn't work in the standard one. You have to upload every single time. Mm -hmm. And also just yeah, having a gallery to work with. Right. Could yeah, you have the legal site in it? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, yeah, you probably yeah. could. Yeah. Um, so the theming on that would be more complicated or would that? I think if anything it would be easier. Um, from kind of what I've done today with theme, I've been able to go from a uh, pretty standard HTML site to, to Drupal in, in a couple of hours and it was really quite easy once I understood what I was doing. I think, I think also the other thing that is um, a big issue at the moment with Drupal 8 is anything kind of on the back end that requires any kind of modifying of, of data. If the data that you enter is what's going to be displayed, then I think that's pretty straightforward and um, I'd feel comfortable um, offering that as a service. But it's when you kind of get to more complex things and you have to link um, data together and things like that, that's when it gets a bit more, more challenging. So what about things like the feeds module, is that in any? Well, I didn't, I didn't look at that. Right, right. There, is, say, <laughs> there is a version 8 release for it, but no idea how good it is. Right. I think one of the key things that we were looking at yesterday was the modules that we've come to rely on from an administration perspective that are missing. Uh, and yeah, as Xavier's saying, if it's a standard content type that just has a title, body, and an image, that's easy enough. But when it's got a relationship to another kind of content model, then we like to present it all in one place, and make it a really kind of nice experience for the for the client. And that facility just doesn't exist in the way at the moment. If we knew more about <coughs> search API, given that most of our knowledge around search is around the um, Apache Solar module. Would it be possible to actually build search experiences in Drupal 8 at the moment, or is there still stuff missing? Um, is yeah, I, I went through a couple of routes. So the, the search API module is it is now um, kind of allows you to define an index in the server, and you can, you can start putting documents in the index. Um, but the only way to kind of have the experiences via views, and and I basically just hit a bit of a problem with that. I've got a fatal error and can just figure out where, where to fix that. So um, that, that's kind of a blocker for that. Um, there's also a module for Drupal 7 called Search API Pages, which basically provides the kind of front end user experience for search that's, that doesn't have a Drupal 8 branch yet. So um, yeah, that, that would not. I think at the moment, for, for me, I, I, I need to do some learning around how Search API is built and how it uses um, the new elements of Drupal 8 before I can effectively contribute back to that. Um, quite, it's going to be a challenge to learn everything, but also quite exciting. We've also been using Drupal 7 for, I don't know about anything else, but three, four years. Mm -hmm. Old it is. Um, and yeah, I, I like the direction it's going, moving to, to kind of PHP practices and using ones like Composer, Package Manager. So I, I think the kind of hardships for learning how Duplate works and how to use it effectively are going to be worthwhile in the end, and, and those skills will be transferable. Yeah, I mean, one of the great things is that they've taken a much more standard route in terms of kind of yeah, using actual PHP in the way that the rest of the community is using PHP. Uh, and certainly from a configuration management perspective, it makes much more sense the way that they're putting it together so that you can actually move things about rather than having to hack things together to, to, make, to make that configuration move between environments. So in terms of kind of doing a continuous integration workflow, um, is certainly built much more from that perspective. And then from a client perspective, like clients are asking us, where's Drupal 8 at the moment? What should we be expecting from it? I like, think it depends on the client really, but I think that if, um, if you've got a big site, I don't think Drupal 8 is going to be ready in a while for big, big sites. Um, I think for smaller sites, 
we need to start kind of thinking about how we would tackle on problems um, using Drupal 8. But um, yeah, overall, it's not it's not ready yet for production sites, in my opinion. And I think the more complex site you've got, the longer it's going to be until it is ready. But um, it is definitely worth starting to look into and um, create some some good practices around how we hmm. how we can use it. So from a client sort of point of view, in terms of user experience, there's not going to be a huge amount of training because there isn't a huge amount of difference really hmm. from the front end side of it. I think um, with the in then if that becomes stable to a point where that's really usable, then that's that's great. There's also a Tor API, which means that you could actually put into configuration an experience that takes the administrators through their site and tells yeah. them where to enter thing and tells the, tells, the, tells them how to actually interact with the site. So that I've not necessarily used it, but I've, I've seen the demos of it and it, and it looks looks pretty good. It'd be something where we could actually kind of build software and carry into it the actual instructions of how to use it. It's great with documentation. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. even files and <laughs> yeah. people saying where the files. Yeah, exactly. But I think apart from those points, yeah, my feeling is the clients wouldn't see that much difference because a lot of Drupal 8 is just incorporating things that you were doing already. Mm. So with various add-on modules and configuration in Drupal 7. So it'll make things hopefully hopefully simpler and more reliable from a building point of view.